Welcome to Metaphysical Soul Speak. I'm your host, Elena Fox Starks. Hey guys, I hope that you're doing well wherever you are and that everything in your world is blissful and peaceful. It, it certainly is not here. Um, things have taken a turn for the worst. This was Monday. <laughs> Uh, day five of Ecuadorian riots and protests. There are looters in Guayaquil that are just smashing windows and taking whatever the hell they want. It's an opportunity for Venezuelanos who have not been given an opportunity to work. A lot of people are homeless. Leaving Venezuela, they had to because they would have been killed. And there are people with families, and I don't blame them, honestly. I just don't. Can't blame them at all. You know, the people that are absolutely desperate. But it's not just the Venezuelanos um, that are families. There's Venezuelans that are also um, really bad, like cartel, uh, assassin-like related people, (laughs) assassins. And they have taken to stealing government vehicles and catching them on fire as the blockades. Literally, they're lighting on fire the military vehicles in Quito. So no no one could go in or out. I just got a message from my government, from the United States government, that warns expatriates what's going on. And they just told me that, or not me, me, but I mean, they told everybody (laughs) in their email that we need to start stocking up with supplies, food, water, um, you know, candles for heat, everything, because they expect it to get really, really bad. In my neighborhood so far, things are cool. People are a little concerned. In the store that's most closest to me, um, the shelves are going empty. All of the businesses closed today at 5 o'clock. That's not normal. Everyone downtown was starting to close their businesses around 1 o'clock. And people are just starting to go home because they're scared of what's happening. They're afraid of what's coming. The first person has that has been killed in this riot happened yesterday. It's just, it's getting worse. There's going to be another transportation strike on Wednesday. I'm assuming that's going to last for two days like this last week. So that seems to be the MO of, of the transportation people. Um, buses, luxury buses go between cities. Uh and um, taxis and I think I was mistaken earlier when I said that uh, taxi drivers have been saying their cars on fire I think there have been roving bands of delinquent type people who have like pushed people's vehicles like taxis in the street to catch them on fire wasn't the taxi drivers themselves because today my friend sent me a video from Quito where a man in a taxi was driving and he was um, there was a blockade of people and as soon as he got out of the vehicle they started hitting him with sticks and and he was trying to defend his, his car because that's his livelihood um, I think I mentioned that there's also in addition to the Venezuelano assassin people who have been paid by the former president Correa, apparently, to do this. This was a staged coup, <clears throat> probably because he knew that Moreno was going to do these things, start these reforms. So because he was a mastermind criminal type and everyone was happy to see him go, I was walking in the streets on New Year's Eve two years ago and there were uh, effigies of Korea being burned in the streets so people were happy when he left and Moreno came in and Moreno is making these sweeping changes 
And like I said before, he's like ripping it off like a Band-Aid. You know, he's not uh, screwing around. He could have gradually did this and this would not have been a problem. But he made it a huge problem. But he did say yesterday that he is going to compensate the poorest of the poor people. They're going to be getting probably between $200 and $300 extra per month just to take the buses. So their costs are already, that's already been considered and they're already going to be fairly compensated for the lack of subsidies. But other people that are in the middle class are going to suffer because apparently the electricity has gone up way, way, way up and people aren't able to pay the electric. And according to some people that we know here locally, the people who run the actual, the people who run the actual company that provides electricity and takes in the money, people are not paying their bills. Now they can't, they don't have the money to do it. Their jobs are not paying enough and it looks like it's possible that the electricity here will be shut off. The subsidies are for gas as well as electric, not for water. I don't think, but I mean, it's, there has been talk in the streets here of water, gas and electric being shut off during these riotous times. My son and I uh, could not find a taxi to go to the local grocery store, so we had a shop next door. The little shop next door was open for a while. They had all their lights off because they can't afford to pay their bill, so they're trying to conserve electricity. They have to pay for the electricity for their freezers and their refrigerators. So... We bought $50 worth of food and water and we filled up everything we have in the house with water, with tap water um, for cooking and bathing and whatnot because we don't know what's going to happen. I mean, when the government says, hey, start stocking up on supplies, it's, it's pretty scary stuff. Now, the chant that they're chanting in the streets, in all the blockades on the outside of every city is the United States is not our neighbor. So why are they blaming the United States for this? Did the United States support Moreno? I don't know. I don't know. The United States dollar is a dollar in everybody's pocket right now in this country. You know, but if if the United States had not stepped in, the economy here would have collapsed years ago. We would have been in the same boat as Colombia. God bless Colombia. It's 10,000 pesos for one candy bar in Colombia. The economy there just went, it just tanked big time there a few years ago, like maybe a decade or so ago. So... It's like insane. I mean, I paid for two weeks in a hostel once, literally with one million pesos. Only time in my life I've been a millionaire. And that was a roughly around $200. But it was a million pesos, something like that. So we're scared. We're sitting here scared. Uh, tomorrow is expected to be a massive demonstration. All of the businesses Start work closed early today, will not open tomorrow. They are afraid downtown in Cuenca, in this peaceful little sweet idyllic town. People are scared. My friend sent me videos of people just walking around with absolute looks of fear on their faces, not knowing what the hell is going to happen with all the businesses closed in Machala. He sent me many different videos from many different road blockages in Quito with all the tanks. A group of people pushed a tank into the river in Quito. I don't know what the purpose of that was. I mean, 
instead of using it as a blockade in that street. I, it's just crazy. It's freaking pandemonium. People are waving the anarchy flag in the streets and people are wearing these uh, masks covering their faces and people can't afford masks have like t-shirts covering their faces with hats it's like nuts it's absolutely completely nuts it's pandemonium you know we have enough food for a few more days we'll probably I, I need to get to an ATM tomorrow I don't even know if it's going to be open but is it is expected that there is going to be violence in the streets, anyone that's outside. So if I have to walk to the ATM that works with my card, I'm going to have to walk like a mile. I'm on the outskirts of town, so I think most of the violence will be downtown, and it, it makes me sad. I have a lot of friends down there. I know a lot of people down there. I have a lot of business I have to conduct in downtown and I can't even get down there this week. And it's like, I don't know. One of the pieces of business I have to conduct is I need to print up a piece of paper, sign it and, and then scan it and email it to the U S government so that I can continue to get paid. So it's like pretty important that I get downtown and, and uh, there's no taxis and I, I just don't know. All the taxis that were downtown today were just transporting their own families. The taxi drivers were just taking their own families, running around doing errands before they bunk in for the night. They hunker down, and that's what's happening. That is what's happening here. We're all starting to freak out a little bit. I found out that um, there are ongoing strikes in Detroit. General Motors has um, basically shut down the plant temporarily. I don't know what all that means, but the people are striking. The people all around the world in various plants, like in Mexico and other places for GM, there's this massive strike. So it's... uh, there's there's chaos and pandemonium is cropping up everywhere. I've been talking to my friend about how we should try to pull every bit of resources together we can and go get a piece of land with an idyllic river and a farm and just work the land and buy horses. If there's ever a blockade, a horse can get around a blockade, so can a motorcycle. But with the with the gas prices rising, horses, we might be <laughs> put back to the medieval times where everyone's riding around on horses again. I found out that a lot of the indigenous people that work for the government in Quito have to take a several hours long bus ride into the capital. And that's where the problem is. So to clear up more information that I gave in the past few days, this is more information coming down from Quito is that, so instead of paying $3 to get to work every day, now they're having to pay six or $7 because the bus prices have gone up. So not only is the government going to have to pay the people, they're probably going to have to subsidize the bus and taxi companies for a while until everything can get a little bit more worked out or the government's going to have to start paying the people more in wages so that they can afford the buses. But big groups of people, they show up on Monday, they have to take these long buses into town, and then on Friday night, the long buses go back to their um, village or what or Pueblo. So that's a big, huge expense. You know, it's like, you know, $40, $50 more a month, I guess. But if they go every single day, it's like a few hundred dollars more a month just for transportation. It's going to be going to be a big thing. I mean, price gouging continues all over the country. Um, 20 people were arrested, as I mentioned yesterday, for raising prices on everything. The local store next door raised toilet paper by a dollar. So four dollars for four rolls of toilet paper. So I paid today. 
I mean, they were mega rolls, but I mean, you know, hey, (laughs) I was like, I can't believe this. I'm going to have to probably walk a mile in this climate to the nearest store. And hopefully they didn't gouge their prices yet. The pharmacy is still open, thank God. But and I have enough medicine for the month, but I might have to go get more because I don't know. They the indigenous people said this is going to go on indefinitely. Indefinitely. They have been standing in the roads outside of every city in Ecuador for five days now with no signs of stopping and the violence is escalating. Unfrickin' believable. I wrote a little email to my uh, oldest son saying, in case we don't have electricity, in case the assassins start coming through the streets here, I mean, we're staying inside, but we don't know if they're going to go through apartment buildings. We don't know what's going to happen. So I said we are in dire straits and we barely have enough food to last out the week. Even though we just spent $70 today in two different stores. We're just uh, scared. So I said in case this is goodbye, we wanted to let you know that we love you very much. That's all I can do. All I can do right now. You know, just hashtag pray for Ecuador. Also hashtag pray for Detroit and hashtag pray for Hong Kong. I don't know what the hell the astrology was four days ago. But it must have been a doozy to, you know, like all this stuff is happening. Detroit happened like 30 days ago and it's still ongoing, but... I mean, there's something in the air. (laughs) I mean, this is the fact that this is ongoing. And I know that there's bigger problems in other places. I know that there's like wars on. And I think the um, something just happened in Syria with the U.S. troops, according to the Turkish prime minister. I saw something in Spanish. I didn't quite understand what it was. What there's a couple words I didn't get. But there's that and. I know the world is in chaos and pandemonium, but it's important for us to remember to breathe. (sighs) Just breathe. As long as there's breath in, in us, there's hope. You know, I get my sunshine when the sun comes up and I open my window and I just stand in the sun every day for a few minutes. To get my vitamin D, you know, it's like, I know I could continue to do that for the next week. I don't have to walk outside if it's going to be dangerous out. Within the city of of Cuenca, there are, um, we've seen some trucks on the road, like that haul food from one place to the other. But as far as getting supplies from outside of the city, whatever this city doesn't supply for itself, we're kind of SOL, pal. <laughs> we're, we're shite out of luck. <laughs> so, I don't know. Uh, several gas stations have been burned down here as part of the violent protests. I don't know why people continuously want to shoot themselves in the freaking foot. It makes me mad that people are so idiotic. You know... Don't buy gas. Don't don't use your car. Don't, you know, it, there's other things you could do. But the other day or yesterday when I went over to the gas station, there were 20 cars in line for gas. And I was like, that was weird. Usually it's like three or four cars, maybe, you know, at the most. I've never seen more than five cars there. And I've lived here a year and a half in this neighborhood. I've never seen that many cars And people were just like desperate to get gas. And the reason is it's one of the only places that weren't, wasn't burned up in town. It's just getting real, man. It's getting real people. Really. (sighs) 
I mean, if the electricity does go out here, I won't be able to put out a an episode. So if I suddenly go off the air, you can just pretty much be rest assured it's because there's no electricity here or no Wi-Fi, one or the other. But I'm going to put an episode out every day until I just can't anymore. So hopefully that won't happen. Hopefully that dire prediction, and it's not a prediction for me, it's just what people in town, the business owners are talking about downtown, um, people that know people that work in the part of government that takes the payments for the electricity. That's what they're saying. That's what they were saying this morning. I have been in riots before. I have lived under martial law before. I've been in crises before. Right now in my neighborhood, it's pretty mellow. It's normal. But some of the images coming across, like the tanks on fire and the people standing around, and it's pretty serious, man. They're literally blocking the roads with giant mounds of just dirt. And a one foot tall little blockade of rocks and logs. I mean, that's what they're using to stop a whole nation from running. They literally shut down a whole country with logs and rocks and dirt. And also giant piles of tires that they catch on fire. Let alone nature has rights, I suppose. We're going to ignore that law right now. Crazy stuff, man. But some of the blockages were just so silly. They were just like one foot tall pile of rocks. And so the trucks can't get through. The buses can't move. The government's saying to still monitor social media because the people will tell everyone else what's going on and they say to um, not travel between cities not that that's even possible my friend is still stuck day five he's still stuck (laughs) he can't get back home and uh, they're saying uh, gather up all the supplies all the emergency supplies you're going to need medical Supplies, you know, um, and I had a feeling, you know, like last month, did I not say in one of my shows that my channel God and, and we were told to get emergency supplies and I was planning on getting emergency supplies this past week. And then this happened and I hadn't gotten the supplies in time. I think I might have one band aid here, you know, and it's not enough in case something major goes down. I mean, I would have liked to have gotten, you know, needles and sutures in case, butterfly stitches and big things of gauze, like real medical supplies, iodine and, and stuff, you know? I mean, we do have a pharmacy nearby, but I don't know how long they're going to stay open. I mean, they're they're talking like, you know, this might be a long-haul situation. I think all the flights have been canceled, or it's possible they will be. And there's no escape even if I wanted to, because all the the roads are blocked. I can't even get to Quito. It's a 10-hour drive through many different places. Yeah, it's just like, it's like completely impossible. There's like no, literally no escape. <laughs> I couldn't even take a taxi to the airport. That That's how bad it is. You can't even do that. Unbelievable. I couldn't even hire a private driver because the roads are blocked. 
<laughs> I mean, I know when you cross a picket line, you're called a scab and people hate you. But what, what happens when they see our white faces and the, the chant that they're chanting at every road blockage is the United States is not our neighbor, never will be our neighbor. Like, what the hell does that mean? I don't know. Hashtag pray for us. <laughs> Hashtag pray for Ecuador. Oh my God. A friend of mine, I, I told him what was going on and he goes, how come this isn't on the news? And I'm like, I don't know. It should be. This should be on the news all over the world. I don't think it is. I might be one of the only media outlets and I'm not even a media outlet person. You know, this is a podcast for spiritual, metaphysical things about the ascension. Inspirational words. I don't know, man. I mean, I, I was living in L.A. when martial law was declared after the L.A. riots, after the Rodney King beating trial. I had to live in a Red Cross shelter after the two weeks, for two weeks after the fire in Paradise, the last major one before the one that just devastated my hometown, my kid's hometown. I was in a water crisis in Lima, Peru, where we didn't have water for two weeks, no running water, and all the roads were blocked and they couldn't get water trucked in. And then I finally got the bright idea to walk a few blocks and take a bus to the nearest town or, or barrio over in, within the city. And there was no water crisis there. And I found out that they singled our neighborhood out and put it on the news only in our neighborhood. So that the rest of Lima thought we were crazy and we were told that there was no water. It was just a political and social experiment to see how the people would react if that was the truth. I mean, I bought like four, five gallon things of water and they were like, are you thirsty? And they were laughing at me in the store. And I'm like, are you not aware of the water crisis? They're like, what are you talking about? And I'm like, people in my neighborhood have been freaking out for like two weeks. We haven't had running water. The whole neighborhood, the water was shut off. And we were told that there are water wars. All the schools in the neighborhood shut down so that the kids could go around giving elderly people bottles of water to drink because they had none. The, the, the local stores, when they get a shipment of water, everyone was only allowed to buy one gallon each for each person. And that was it. I mean, it was like such a bad crisis. And then to go one neighborhood over, my friend wrote me and she said, well, my friend in Lima works, he, he works in Miraflores. He's a very prominent surgeon and he's very wealthy and he could house you if you need housing, if it's dangerous. But he says there's no water crisis and you're crazy. I'm like, that's when I realized that the news was meant for different barrios what gets broadcast in each individual section of the city in Peru was completely different. Completely different. Even my boyfriend who lived, uh, he moved after we broke up and he was my ex-boyfriend when this happened. He said I was crazy. He was spending all his time in uh, Barranco, which is, you know, just a couple barrios over. And he's like, I watch the news here all the time. They never mentioned it. I'm like, go to, and then, and I, I told him, like, go to the, come here, bring your motorcycle, come on over here and go look in the stores. And he did, and he goes, how come there's nothing on the shelves? I'm like, see, social experimentation. They're lying to us. And when the water got turned back on, there was a disease in the water, and my kids and I all got H. pylori, and we spent the next six weeks trying to cure our uh, stomach issues taking medicine and gain x-rays. My son was in the hospital for like a whole day because his got really bad. My youngest just for a social and political experiment. So we have lived through some pretty major stuff. There was 
a riot in Mexico that broke out across the street from us when they uh, double charged a lady uh, taxes for her business. She lived in one state and had her business in another state. And when she paid her taxes for her business in the state where she lived, which was the law, because she didn't want to lose her home. And then they came around asking her for the same exact taxes from the current state where her business was. And it was a double taxation. And that was illegal because she had exemption and they threatened it to seize her business. And so she took all of the things that she owned from her business, put it in the street and caught it on fire. And she said, I'd rather lose my business than pay double taxes. Well, when that happened, everyone went on a rampage and there was riots in the streets for like a week. And it was really hard. Like the taxis wouldn't get, couldn't get past the riot police. We had to walk six blocks carrying like 10 bags of groceries. It was ridiculous. And on the news, they said the riots were started by gringos in the neighborhood. Well, guess who the gringos in the neighborhood were? My children in May and an old German dude who was in his 80s. And that was it. The guy came from Germany every year to spend his summers swimming in the sea. And he had been doing that for 30 years. Just a peaceful old dude. And that was it. We were the only gringos in that neighborhood in that exact street where it happened. And we were locked in like prisoners, locked in the gate because it was for our own safety. Because what had been said on the news about us. That was a scary time. That was a really scary time. This, this is pretty scary though, because it's the whole damn country, not just a neighborhood, not just one city. This is probably overall the scariest situation we've ever been in because always before I had the money to leave. I always had the way, the means, like in LA, I had friends You know, in Chico, I had a lot of friends. I had a car. I don't have a car here. This is scary shit, man. And it's hitting the fan and fast. I mean, it's it's scary. Like I said, my neighborhood is right now, today, in this moment, it's pretty peaceful. We're not gonna go out after dark. My my I heard my kid telling his friend, he's like, I'm sorry. I, I can't go to your house tonight. And he's like, you know, come on over. Cause he's scared. And my son's like, no, I'm not leaving the house. I mean, they're shouting in the streets, United States, you're not our neighbors. I don't know what, why are they against the U S suddenly? Like what we did nothing. Like at least the expatriates we're here for a reason. You know, we don't want to live in our own country. So, but we're still scared. What's going to happen. What could happen? You know, So I don't know. All I could tell my son and myself is like, you know what? We'll watch a few videos and see what's happening just to inform ourselves. And when I'm done with my show, we're going to watch comedy shows. We'll watch cartoons or we'll watch Carmen Sandiego or Archer or something. Or we'll watch a funny movie because we need to get our minds out of this fear and arriving up into the higher vibrational elements Connecting with our chakras and and cleansing our auras from the fear. I mean, I know you guys, I mean, if you're sensitive, you're going to feel it from me right now because it's like, wow, this is out of all the crises I've seen in my lifetime. This is the worst because it's a whole country. Anyway, you just got an earful on what's happening politically and the strategies of violent and criminal minded men, (laughs) corrupt indigenous leaders and the poor indigenous. And and my heart goes out to all of the indigenous people that are just struggling and barely making ends meet. I'm just, I don't know. I mean, I feel like we should make an effort to go out when this is all over and make sure that all the indigenous lands where they have massive community, you know, we should make sure they have massive community gardens 
and chickens and livestock, you know, goats for milk, cows for milk, chickens for eggs, you know, I just feel like I want to make sure that even if they don't go to work and don't have money, that they always have what they need to stay alive. You know, it's giving me ideas. It's, it's really giving me ideas and I'm, <laughs> I'm like inspired, but I'm also a little scared. I'm going to be honest. I mean, usually when stuff like this happens and you go around talking to people, usually they say, ah, oh, no pasa nada, no pasa nada, right? Nothing will happen. Don't worry. No te preocupes, mi amor. You know, they say like, don't worry, my love. Everything's going to be fine. That's usually what I get. And today when I talked to a couple people, they were like, it's because of the president. It's because of this. It's because of that. Usually they say no pasa nada. And that, that brought a little bit of an alarm bell in my mind because usually people like to poo poo it. Like, Oh, don't worry. It's people are going to be mad and then they're going to be fine. It's going to be a fine. And now they're saying, no, it's, um, we have to worry for the indigenous people. We have to be there for them. We have to, you know, and it's like, I agree with that. We do have to, but I found out that the corrupt leaders, when the government gives the tribal people money, the corrupt leaders put it in their own pockets and the people are still starving. And that does not sit well with me. I mean, I don't think this happens in the indigenous populations in the United States. I know my Cherokee nation I mean, I watch their videos on TV of their government proceedings, and they're all very fair. You know, and I'm proud about that. I'm grateful to know that that's, that my people there at least are good. But I don't know. I mean, I don't hear this, like the corruption thing in the U.S. It, maybe it happens. Maybe it, maybe it happens with every group of every people everywhere, no matter what the planet <laughs> they live on. But I don't know, guys. I'm just, um, I'm not feeling discouraged or anything like that. I feel hopeful. Revolution is coming. Revolution is here. Revolution is per- is in Peru right now. Revolution is in Ecuador right now. Viva la revolución. Definitely going to anarchy tattoo after this. No, <laughs> <laughs> I've lived through so much anarchy in my life. I'm going to get an anarchy tattoo. <laughs> oh my God. All right. Well, Shimon resonance news today is from Italy. Even today, very light activity. The maximum 17 Hertz was reached shortly after four UTC. This light activity, however, lasted from midnight to 15. UTC time. So 17 Hertz frequency only in Italy. God, I'm, I'm, I'm honestly, I'm just super grateful that I have electricity right now and Wi-Fi. All right. At midnight in California, they started off at 20 Hertz frequencies. That's pretty low compared to what's been. And they went down to zero by 4 a.m. Zero. Now in Hafuf in the kingdom of Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia, 101. They started off at, and they went up to 103 by 4 a.m. Midnight in Lithuania, they started off at 149 hertz frequency, and by 4 a.m. they were still at 149 hertz frequency. Just a straight line all the way across for them. Um, and in Alberta, Canada, they started off at 165 hertz frequency on the Schumann resin scale, and they went up to 178 by 4 a.m. So they're probably feeling a lot of ascension symptoms. Uh, Northland, New Zealand started off at 79 hertz frequency and went up to 84 by 4 a.m. And in Holului, South Africa, they started off at 178 hertz frequency at midnight and went to 4 a.m., at 187 so let me see that one again did they actually go up yeah they did all right we have 178 to 187 my dyslexia kicked in for a minute i'm like oh they didn't move at all i'm like wait 
No, they did. <laughs> um, yeah, it was weird. So 178 to 187. So that's it on the Shimon Resonance news. Um, let me ask my higher guidance. Are we at 99 in Ascension Symptom Scale? Yeah, we're still at 99. Can you imagine all those people? I don't know if they're awake or not, you know, doing the riots, but they're also receiving all the Ascension symptoms that we're all receiving. They're just not awake yet, maybe. Probably the assassins for sure or not. But, I mean, look at that. They're receiving all of the Ascension symptoms while they're out there rioting and protesting. Day and night, blockages of the road. Crazy. Crazy. The whole situation is crazy. It's just completely loco. <laughs> es muy tan loco. <laughs> ¿Qué pasó con mi país nuevo? What is happening with my new country? It is so crazy. No entiendo qué pasó. I don't understand what happened. All right. <laughs> uh. Lesson 119 in A Course in Miracles, ACIM.org. You can download an app or just go look at look up the Foundation for Inner Peace and read it for yourself if you like. It, I highly recommend doing the lessons. Um, you know, they have little exercises to do throughout the day to get your mind in a different headspace, and it has a high vibration to it. And that's why I'm reading them. <laughs> so... We're on lesson 119 today, and the first part of which is taken from lesson 107. Truth will correct all errors in my mind. Truth will correct all errors in my mind. I am mistaken when I think I can be hurt in any way. I am God's son whose self rests safely in the mind of God. Okay, well, this is a really good one for me to get today. <laughs> I love how it's like so related to the thing that I was just talking about, and I didn't even know what the lesson was going to be until I got there. Oh my God, it's like just every damn day. <laughs> Pretty cool. Thank you, God. Thank you for that one. <laughs> All right. Um, uh, the second part of the lesson is taken from. Uh, the original lesson of 108 and the review thought of the day is to give and to receive are one in truth to give and to receive are one in truth. I will forgive all things today that I may learn how to accept the truth in me and come to recognize my sinlessness well, amen to that, buddy. <laughs> All right, guys, I am going to take a quick break. And when I come back, I'm going to continue our reading of the Spirits book by Alan Kardec. This is a 162 year old manuscript. And Alan Kardec, as you recall, is not his original real name. Leon Ravel, I think. But you could go see all about his life in the movie Kardec. And this is a book that just sparked so much interest around the world and then made the Vatican so angry they had to have book burnings of this book all over the world. And thank God a lot of the copies survived from Brazil. And... This was translated from French to Portuguese to English. And I now someone has put it on the internet in a PDF form. <laughs> 162 years later, his work prevails. And it's very interesting because he took a scientific approach to his studies of mediumship and the spirit world and... The answers have been pretty incredible. So when we come back, we're going to go over book two, chapter two in the spirits book right after these messages.
If you haven't heard about Anchor, it's high time you did. It is the absolute easiest way to make a podcast. First of all, it's absolutely free. Second of all, they have creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or your computer. You guys have known that I've been doing this for eight months using the Anchor.fm app right on my cell phone, and I have done it everywhere, right? I have recorded this in my living room, my bedroom, little cafes in Quito, Ecuador, all over Cuenca. It's so absolutely easy to make your podcast and editing is just a snap. Anchor also will distribute your podcast for you. And it took me about two and a half months to become syndicated. And now I'm available on Spotify, Apple podcast, and many more and so can you you can make money from your podcast also and there's no minimum requirement you get paid from your very first listener it is everything that you need to make a podcast all in one place so please if you are interested in making a podcast of your very own do not hesitate to start with anchor Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started today. Metaphysical Soul Speak is run on sponsors and listener support. This means listeners like you. If you are so inclined to support my efforts and my little podcast, please visit me at anchor.fm forward slash metaphysical and pledge an amount of your choosing today. Thank you. This is part four of The Spirits Book by Alain Kardec, published in 1857. Chapter 2 of Book 2, Incarnation of Spirits. Number 1, Aim of Incarnation. Number 2, The Soul. Number 3, Materialism. First topic, Aim of Incarnation. Question 132. What is the aim of the incarnation of spirits? The spirits answer thus. It is a necessity imposed on them by God as the means of attaining perfection. For some of them, it is an expiation for others, a mission. In order to attain perfection, it is necessary for them to undergo all the vicissitudes of corporeal existence. It is the experience acquired by expiation that constitutes its usefulness. Incarnation has another aim, viz. that of fitting the spirit to perform his share in the work of creation, for which purpose he is made to assume a corporeal apparatus in harmony with the material state of each world into which he is sent and by means of which he is enabled to accomplish his special work in connection with that world which has been appointed to him by the divine ordering. He is thus made to contribute his quota towards the general wheel, W-E-A-L, I I, I don't know this word, towards the general wheel while achieving his own advancement. Now, uh, Alan Kardec himself wrote a little blurb under that. He said, The action of corporeal beings is necessary to the carrying on of the work of the universe, but God, in his wisdom, has willed that this action should furnish them with the means of progress and of advancement towards himself. And thus, through an admirable law of his providence, all things are linked together, and solidarity is established between all the realms of nature. Question 133. Is incarnation necessary for the spirits who, from the beginning, have followed the right road? The spirits answer, 
All are created simple and ignorant. They gain instruction in the struggles and tribulations of corporeal life. God, being just, could not make some of them happy without trouble and without exertion, and consequently without merit. So the follow-up question is, but if so, what do spirits gain by having followed the right road since they are not thereby exempted from the pains of corporeal life? The spirits answer, they arrive more quickly at the goal, and besides the sufferings of life are often a consequence of the imperfection of the spirit. Therefore, the fewer his imperfections, the less will be his sufferings. <clears throat> he who is neither envious, jealous, avaricious, nor ambitious will not have to undergo the torments, which are consequences of those defects. Okay. The soul. Question 134. What is the soul? The spirit's answer, an incarnate spirit. Follow-up question, what was the soul before its union with the body? The answer, a spirit. Follow-up question, souls and spirits are then the very same thing? They answer, yes, souls are only spirits. Before uniting itself with the body, the soul is one of the intelligent beings who people the invisible world and who temporarily assume a fleshly body in order to affect their purification and enlightenment. Question 135. Is there in any man, I'm sorry, is there in man anything else than a soul and a body. And they say, there is the link which unites the soul and body. And he asks the follow-up question, what is the nature of that link? The spirits answer, it is semi-material, that is to say of a nature intermediate between soul and body, as it must necessarily be, in order that they may be enabled to communicate with, with each other. It is by means of this link that the spirit acts upon matter and that matter acts reciprocally upon the spirit. So he had to make notes, <laughs> of course, after that. And he says, man is thus formed of three essential elements or parts. First, the body or material being anag analogous to the animal's and animated by the same vital principle. Second, the soul or incarnated spirit of which the body is the habitation. Third, the intermediary principle or peri-spirit, a semi-material substance which constitutes the innermost envelope of the spirit and unites the soul with the body. This triplicity is analogous to that of the fruit which consists of the germ, the perisperm, and the rind or shell. Okay. <laughs> Question 136. Is the soul independent of the vital principle? They answer, the body is only the envelope of the soul, as we have repeatedly told you. Sounds like they're getting pissed off, doesn't it? And he asks, can a body exist without a soul? And they answer, yes. Ugh, creepy. Can a body exist without a soul? <laughs> yes. But it is only when the body ceases to live that the soul quits it. <laughs> Previous to birth. The union between the soul and the body is not complete, but when this union is definitively established, it is only the death of the body that can sever the bonds that unite it to the soul and thus allow the soul to withdraw from it. Sorry, I had to turn the page. <laughs> to allow the soul to withdraw from it. Organic life may vital vitalize the body without a soul, 
but the soul cannot inhabit a body deprived of organic life. So the follow-up question, what would our body be if it had no soul? Spirit's answer, a mass of flesh without intelligence, anything you call, you choose to call it, excepting a man. All right. Question 137. Can the same spirit incarnate itself into two different bodies at the same time? Huh. The answer, no. The spirit is indivisible. It cannot simultaneously animate two different things, two different beings. And they wrote bead in the medium's book, the chapter on by corporality and transfiguration. Interesting. Question 138. What is to be thought of the opinion of those who regard the soul as being the principle of material life? They say that is a question of definition. We attach but slight importance to mere words. You should begin by agreeing among yourselves as to the exact meaning of the expressions you employ. Okay. A little snarky, isn't it? (laughs) Question 139. Certain spirits and certain philosophers before them have defined the soul as, quote, an animated spark that has emanated from the great whole. Unquote. Why this contradiction? And the spirits answer, there is nothing contradictory in such a definition. Everything depends on the meaning you attribute to the words you use. Why have you not a word for each thing? Again, a bit snarky today, right? So Alan Kardec writes his own words here. He says, The word soul is employed to express very different things. Sometimes it is used to designate the principle of life, and in this case, it is correct to say figuratively that the soul is an animated spark that has emanated from the great whole. These latter words designate the universal source of the vital principle, of which being each absorbs a portion that returns to the general mass after its death. This idea does not exclude that of a moral being, a distinct personality, independent of matter and preserving its own individuality. It is this being which at other times is called the soul, and it is in this sense that we speak of the soul as an incarnate spirit. In giving different definitions of soul, the spirits who have given them have spoken according to their various ways of applying that word, and also according to the terrestrial ideas with which they are more or less imbued. This apparent confusion results from the insufficiency of human language, which does not possess a specific word for each idea and insufficiency that gives rise to the vast number of misapprehensions and discussions. It is for this reason that the higher spirits tell us to begin by distinctly defining the meaning of the words we employ. Question 140. What is to be thought of the theory according to which the soul is subdivided into as many parts as there are muscles in the body and thus presides over each of the bodily functions? Oh. Huh. Uh, The spirit's answer, that again depends on the meaning attached to the word soul. If by soul is meant the vital fluid, that theory is right. If the word is used to express an incarnate spirit, it is wrong. We have already told you that a spirit is indivisible. It transmits movement to the bodily organs through the intermediary fluids, but it undergoes no division. See, this fluid thing is really freaking me out a little bit. I want to know more and more. I'm like on the edge of my seat. (laughs) Okay, his question that was following up says, nevertheless, there are spirits who have given this definition. And they say, spirits who are ignorant may mistake the effect for the cause. Okay. All right, so his note on this 
part of the discussion says, the soul acts through the intermediary of the bodily organs, and those organs are animated by the vital fluid, which is distributed among them, aired more abundantly in those which constitute the centers or foci, foci, F-O-C-I, like, it's like a plural of focus, the centers or foci of movement for each organism. But this explanation becomes inadmissible when the term soul is employed to designate the spirit which inhabits the body during life and quits it at death. Okay, um, question 141. Is there any truth in the opinion of those who suppose that the soul is exterior to the body and environs it. And the spirits answer thus, the soul is not shut up in the body like a bird in a cage. It radiates in all directions and manifests itself outside the body as a light radiates from a glass globe or as a sound is propagated from a sonorous center. In this sense, the soul may be said to be exterior to the body, but it is not, therefore, to be considered as enveloping the body. The soul has two envelopes. The first or innermost of these is a light and subtle nature, is what you call these pure spirit. The other gross material heavy is the body. The soul in the center of both of these envelopes, like the germ in the stone of the fruit, as we have already said. Question 142. What is to be thought of that other theory according to which the formation of the soul of the child is carried on to completion during the successive periods of the human lifetime? The spirits answer thus. The spirit is a unit and as entire in the child as in the adult. It is only the bodily organs or instruments of manifestations of the soul that are gradually developed and completed in the course of a lifetime. Here again, you mistake the effect for the cause. Question 143. Why do not all spirits divine, define the soul in the same way? And the spirits answer thus. All spirits are not equally enlightened in regards to these matters. Some spirits are still so little advanced intellectually as to be incapable of understanding abstract ideas. They are like children in your world. Other spirits are full of false learning and make a vain parade. (laughs) Oh, vain parade brings up so many images. Sorry. Other spirits are full of false learning and make a vain parade (laughs) of words in order to impose their authority upon those who listen to them. They also resemble too many in your world. And besides, even spirits who are really enlightened may express themselves in terms which appear to be different, but which at bottom mean the same thing, especially in regards to matters which your language is incapable of expressing dearly and which can only be spoken of to you by means of figures and comparisons that you mistake for literal statements of fact. Question 144. What is to be understood by the souls of the world? Or, I'm sorry, what is to be understood by the soul of the world? They answer, the universal principle of life and intelligence from which individualities are produced. But very often, they who make use of these terms do not know what they mean by them. The word soul is so elastic that everyone interprets it according to his own imaginings. Certain persons have also attributed a soul to the earth, which must be understood as indicating the assemblage of devoted spirits who direct your actions in the right direction when you listen to them, and who are, as it were, the lieutenants of God in the administration of your globe. Question 145. How is it that so many philosophers, both ancient and modern, have so long been discussing psychological questions without having arrived (coughs) at the truth? (coughs) The spirits answer thus. Those men who were precursors of the eternal truths of this true spiritist doctrine for which they have prepared the way. 
They were men and therefore subject to error because they often mistook their own ideas for the true light. But their very errors have served the cause of truth by bringing into relief both sides of the argument. Moreover, among those errors are to be found many great truths which a comparative study of the various theories thus put forth would enable you to discover. Question 146. Has the school... School... Oh my God, sorry. No, question 146. Has the soul a circumscribed and determinate seat in the body? They answer, no. But what may be said to reside more especially in the head, in the case of men of great genius and of all who think much and in the heart in the case of those who feel much and whose actions have always a humanitarian aim. Okay, that's like so interesting because you think that someone's soul who like people who are sexual addicts, that their soul is more residing in the seat of their <clears throat> seat. <laughs> Just a thought. <clears throat> Weird, right? But that's maybe possibly where someone's soul resides if that's what they're only thinking about usually. A very interesting idea, right? Makes sense in a weird way. All right. Follow-up question to that is, what is to be thought of the opinion of those who place the soul in a center of organic life? And the spirit's answer, the spirit may be said to inhabit more, especially such a part of your organism, because it is to such a part that all the sensations <laughs> converge. But those who place it in what they consider to be the center of vitality confound it with a vital fluid or principle. Nevertheless, it may be said that the soul is more especially present in the organs <coughs> <laughs> which serve for the manifestation of the intellectual and moral qualities. Huh. <laughs> okay. Materialism. Question 147. Why is it that anatomists, physiologists, and those generally who apply themselves to the pursuit of the natural scientists are so apt to fall into materialism? The spirits answer thusly. The physio physiologist refers everything to the standard of his senses. Human pride imagines that it knows everything and refuses to admit that there can be anything which transcends the human understanding. Science itself inspires some minds with presumption. They think that nature can have nothing hidden from them. <laughs> yeah. Question 148. Is it not regrettable that materialism should be a consequence of studies which ought, on the contrary, to show men the superiority of the intelligence that governs the world? The spirits answer thusly. It is not true that materialism is a consequence of those studies. It is a result of the imperfection which leads men to draw a false conclusion from their studies for, for men may make a bad use of the very best things. <laughs> okay. The idea, uh, the idea of annihilation moreover troubles those who profess to hold it more than they will allow to be seen. And those who are the loudest in proclaiming their materialistic convictions are often more boastful than brave. The greater number of the so-called materialists are only such because they have no rational ground of belief in a future life. Show a firm anchor of rational belief in a future state to those who see only a yawning void before them, and they will grasp it with the eagerness of drowning men. Okay, so then he goes into this massively long... Um, Explanation. This is Alan Kardec's words now. He writes, 
There are those who, through an aberration of the intellect, can see nothing in organized beings but the action of matter, and attribute to this action all the or all the phen- phenomena of existence. They have seen in the human body only the action of an electrical machine that they have studied the mechanism of life only in the play of the bodily organ. They have often seen life extinguished by the rupture of a filament and they have seen nothing but this filament. They have looked to see whether anything still remained and as they have found nothing but matter that has become inert, as they have neither seen the soul escape from the body nor been able to take hold of it, they have concluded that everything is reducible to the properties of matter and that death is consequently the annihilation of all thought. A melancholy conclusion if such were really the case. For were it so, good and evil would be alike devoid of aim. Every man would be justified in thinking only of himself and in subordinating every other consideration to the satisfaction of his material instincts. Thus, All social ties would be broken and the holiest affections would be destroyed forever. Happily for mankind, these ideas are far from being general. Their area may even be said to be a narrow one limited to the scope of invidious options. Invidious opinions, for nowhere nowhere have they been erected into a system of doctrine. A state of society founded on such a basis would contain within itself the seeds of its own dissolution, and its members would tear each other into pieces like so many ferocious beasts of prey. Man has an intuitive belief that, for him, everything does not end with the life of his body. He has a horror of annihilation. No matter how obstinately men may have set themselves against the idea of a future life, there are very few who, on the approach of death, do not anxiously ask themselves what is going to become of them, for the thought of bidding an eternal adieu to life is appalling to the stoutest of hearts. Who indeed could look with indifference on the prospect of an absolute and eternal separation from all that he has loved? Who without terror could behold yawning beneath him the bottomless abyss of nothingness in which all his faculties and aspirations are to be swallowed up forever? Who would calmly say to himself, after my death there will be nothing for me but the void of annihilation, all will be ended. A few days hence, all memory of me will have been blotted out from the remembrance of those who survived me, and the earth itself will retain no trace of my passage. Even the good that I have done will be forgotten by the ungrateful mortals, mortals whom I have benefited. And there is nothing to compensate for me for all this loss, no other prospect, beyond this ruin than that of my body devoured by worms. <laughs> Yeah, I don't think anyone says that. So he he goes on. Is there not something horrible in such a picture? Something that sends an icy chill through the heart? Religion teaches us that such cannot be our destiny. Reason confirms the teachings of religion. But the vague and definite assurance of a future existence, which is all that is given us either by religion or reason, cannot satisfy our natural desire for some positive proof in a matter of such paramount importance to us. And it is just the lack of such proof in regard to a future life that in so many cases engenders doubt as to its reality. Admitting we have a soul, many very naturally ask, what is our soul? Has it a form, an appearance of any kind? Is it a limited being or is it something undefined and impersonal? Some say that it is the breath of God. Others say that it is a spark. Others again declare it to be part of the great whole, the principle of life and of intelligence. But what do we learn from these statements? What is the good of our possessing a soul if our soul <clears throat> is to be merged in immensity like a drop of water in the ocean? Is not the loss of our individuality equivalent as far as we're concerned to annihilation the soul is said to be immaterial but that which is immaterial can have no defined proportions and therefore can have no reality for us 
Religion also teaches that we shall be happy or unhappy according to the good or the evil we have done. But what uh, of what nature are the happiness or unhappiness thus promised us in another life? Is that happiness a state of beatitude in the bosom of God and external contemplation with no other employment than that of singing the praises of the Creator? And the flames of hell, are they a reality or a figure of speech? The church itself attributes to them a figurative meaning, but of what nature are the sufferings thus figuratively shadowed forth? And where is the scene of those sufferings? In short, what shall be, what shall we do, what shall we see in that other world which is to await us all? No one, it is averred, has ever come back to us to give an account of that world. But the statement is erroneous and the mission of spiritism is precisely to enlighten us in regard to a future which awaits us to enable us with certain limits to see it, to touch it, not merely as a deduction of our reason, but through the evidence of facts. Thanks to the communications made to us by people of that other world that the latter is no longer a mere presumption, a probability, which each one pictures to himself according to his own fancy, which poets embellish with fictitious and allegorical images that serve us only to deceive us. It is that other world itself, in its reality, which has now been brought before us, for it's the beings of life beyond the grave who come to us, who describe to us the situations in which they find themselves who tell us what they are doing, who allow us to become, so to say, the spectators of the details of their new order of life, and thus show us the inevitable fate, which is reserved for each of us according to our merits and our misdeeds. Is there anything anti-religious in such a demonstration? Assuredly not. Since it furnishes unbelievers with the ground of belief and inspires lukewarm believers with renewed fervor and confidence. Spiritism is thus seen to be the most powerful auxiliary of religion. And if it be such, it must be acknowledged to exist by the permission of God for the purpose of giving new strength to our wavering convictions and thus leading us back into the right road by the prospect of our future happiness. Book 2, Chapter 3, Return from the Corporeal to the Spirit Life. Number 1, The Soul After Death, Its Individuality, Eternal Life. Number 2, Separation of Soul and Body. Number 3, Temporarily Confused State of the Soul After Death. The Soul After Death, Question 149. What becomes of the soul at the moment of death? The spirit's answer, it becomes again a spirit. That is to say, it returns into the world of spirits, which it had quitted for a short time. Question 150. Does the soul after death preserve its individuality? The soul's answer, the spirit's answer, sorry. Yes, it never loses its individuality. Woo! What would the soul be if it did not preserve it? <sighs> so it was like a big question for me. All right. The follow-up question to that is, how does the soul preserve the consciousness of its individuality since it no longer has its material body? <laughs> Interesting. The spirit's answer. It still has a fluid peculiar to itself, which it draws from the atmosphere of its planet and which represents the appearance 
it's a, the appearance of his last incarnation. It's Perry spirit. Follow up question to that. Does the soul take nothing of this life away with it? The spirits answer, nothing but the remembrance of that life and the desire to go to a better world. This remembrance is full of sweetness or bitterness according to the use it has made of the earthly life it has quitted. The more advanced is the degree of its purification, the more clearly does it perceive the futility of all that it has left behind it upon the earth. Question 151. What is to be thought of the opinion that the soul after death returns to the universal whole? Spirits answer. Does not the mass of spirits considered in its totality constitute a whole? Does it not constitute a world? When you are in an assembly, you form an integral part of that assembly, and yet you still retain your individuality. Again, a little snarky, right? Maybe I'm just reading it snarkily. <laughs> yeah, it's possible. Question 152. What proof can we have of the individuality of the soul after death? The Spirit's answer. Is not this proof furnished by the communications which you obtain? If you were not blind, you would see. If you were not deaf, you would hear. For you are often spoken to by a voice which reveals to you the existence of a being exterior to yourself. All right, that one did seem very snarky. So maybe it's not me or the way I'm reading it. Oh my God. And again, he goes into a million lines of explanation. All right. Sorry. (laughs) All right. So Alan Kardec's words after that are those who think that the soul returns after death into the universal whole are in error. If they imagine that it loses its individuality, like a drop of water that falls into the ocean They are right if they mean by the universal whole, the totality of all incorporeal beings of which each soul or spirit is an element. If souls were blended together into a mass, they would possess only the qualities common to the totality of the mass. There would be nothing to distinguish them from one another, and they would have no special intellectual or moral qualities of their own. But the communications we obtain from spirits give abundant evidence of the possession by each spirit of the consciousness of theme and of a distinct will personal to itself. The infinite diversity of characteristics of all kinds presented by them is at once a consequence and the evidence of their distinctive and personal individuality. If after death there were nothing but what is called the great whole absorbing all individualities, this whole would be uniform in its characteristics and, in that case, all the communications received from the individual world would be identical. But as among the denizens of what the other world we meet, with some who are good and some who are bad and some who are learned and some who are ignorant, some who are happy and some who are unhappy, And as they present us with every shade of character, some being frivolous and others serious, etc., it is evident that they are different individualities, perfectly distinct from one another. This individuality becomes still more evident when they are able to prove their identity by unmistakable tokens, by personal details relating to their terrestrial life, and susceptible of being Verified, And it cannot be a matter of doubt when they manifest themselves to our sight under the form of apparitions. The individuality of the soul has been taught theoretically as an article of faith. Spiritism renders it patent as an evident and so to say a material fact. <laughs> Is anybody out there also thinking of Sting's song? We are spirits in the material world. Our spirits in the material world. (laughs) Uh, I don't know. That song just came up. I don't even know if you guys know that song. It wasn't 
I don't think it was a hit or anything, was it? I can't remember. I used to have all of Sting's songs memorized, whether they were on the radio or not. I had all of his albums at one point after he went solo. Right, anyway, back to the book. Question 153. In what sense should we understand eternal life? The Spirit's answer, It is the life of the Spirit that is eternal. That of the body is transitory and fleeting. When the body dies, the soul re-enters the eternal life. Follow-up question. Would it not be more correct to apply the term eternal life to the life of the purified spirits, of those who, having attained to the degree of relative perfection, have no longer to undergo the discipline of suffering? The spirits answer, the life of that degree might rather be termed eternal happiness, but this is a question of words. You may call things as you please, provided you are agreed among yourselves as to your meaning. Separation of soul and body. Question 154. Is the separation of the soul from the body a painful process? The spirits answer, no. (sighs) Thank God. No, the body often suffer, suffers more during life than at the moment of death when the soul is usually unconscious of what is occurring to the body. Sorry to turn the page. The sensations experienced at the moment of death are often a source of enjoyment for the spirit who recognizes them as putting an end to the term of his exile. So... Alan Kardec adds his little two cents. (laughs) His commentary says, In cases of natural death, where dissolution occurs as a consequence of the exhaustion of the bodily organs through age, man passes out of life without perceiving that he is doing so. It is like the flame of a lamp that goes out for want of ailment. It says aliment. A-L-I-M-E-N-T. I don't know if it's a typo or not. It's like a flame of a lamp that goes out for want of aliment. I think that means food. Alimentation. Alimentation. I think that's in French as well as Spanish. Alimentation means food. So if we put it like this, it's like a flame of a lamp that goes out for want of food. All right. That's cool. Uh, Question 155. How is the separation of soul and body effected? The spirits answer, the bonds which retains the soul being broken, it just disengages itself from the body. Cool. Probably easier than a rocket booster falling off from a rocket, disengaging itself from the body. All right. (laughs) The follow-up question, is the separation effected instantaneously and by means of an abrupt transition? Is there any distinctly marked line of demarcation between life and death? No, they say. The soul disengages itself gradually. It does not escape at once from the body like a bird whose cage is suddenly opened. The two states touch and run into each other, and the spirit extricates itself himself little by little from his fleshly bonds which are loosed but not broken and he puts a comment here Alan Kardec says during life a spirit is held to the body by his semi-material envelope or peri-spirit Death is the destruction of the body only, but not of the second envelope, which separates itself from the body when the play of organic life ceases in the latter. Observation shows us that the separation of the pair of spirit from the body is not suddenly completed at the moment of death, but is only affected gradually and more or less slowly in different individuals. In some cases, it is affected so quickly that the peri spirit is entirely separated from the body within a few hours of the death of the latter. But in other cases, and especially in the case of those whose life has been grossly material and sensual, this deliverance is much less rapid and sometimes takes days, weeks, even months for its accomplishment. Blah. (laughs) 
This delay does not imply the slightest persistence of vitality in the body, nor any possibility of its return to life, but is simply the result of a certain affinity between the body and the spirit, which affinity is always more or less tenacious in proportion to the preponderance of material materiality in the affections of the spirit during his earthly life. It is, in fact, only rational to suppose that the more closely a spirit has identified himself with matter, the greater will be his difficulty in separating himself from his material body. <sighs> wow. While on the contrary, intellectual and moral activity, the habitual elevation of thought effect a commencement of this separation even during the life of the body. And therefore, when death occurs, the separation is almost instantaneous. The study of a great number of individuals after their death has shown that affinity, which in some cases continues to exist between the soul and the body, is sometimes extremely painful, for it causes the spirit to perceive all of the horror of the decompos decomposition of the latter. Uh, yuck. This experience is exceptional and peculiar to certain kinds of life and certain kinds of death. It sometimes occurs in the case of those who have committed suicide. Okay. He would have been a really fun person to have at a dinner party. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Actually, maybe he might have been, but... Ew, creepy topic, that. Question 156. Can the definitive separation of the soul and body take place before the complete cessation of organic life? The spirit's answer. It sometimes happens that the soul has quitted the body before the last agony comes on. <laughs> so that the latter is only the closing act of merely organic life. The dying man has no longer any consciousness of himself and nevertheless there still remains in him a faint breathing of vitality the body is a machine that is kept in movement by the heart it continues to live as long as the heart causes the blood to circulate in the veins and has no need of the soul to do that creepy <laughs> 157 question 157 does the soul sometimes at the moment of death experience an aspiration or an ecstasy that gives it a foreglimpse of the world into which it is about to return spirits answer the soul often feels the loosening of the bonds that attach it to the body and does its utmost to hasten and complete the work of separation Already partially freed from matter, it beholds the future unrolled before it and enjoys in anticipation the spirit state upon which it is about to re-enter. Question 158. Do the transformations of the caterpillar, which first of all crawls upon the ground and then shuts itself up into its chrysalis in seeming death to be reborn therefrom into a new and brilliant existence, give us anything like a true idea of the relation between our terrestrial life, the tomb and our new existence beyond the latter. The spirits answer thus an idea on a very small scale. The image is good, but nevertheless it would not do to accept it literally as you so often do in regard to such images. Yeah, right. Question 159. What sensation is experienced by the soul at the moment when it recovers its consciousness in the world of spirits? The spirits answer. That depends on the circumstances. He who has done evil from the love of evil <laughs> is overwhelmed with shame for his wrongdoing. With the righteousness, it is very different. His soul seems to be eased of a heavy load, for it does not dread the most searching glance. Interesting. Shay, shay, shame. Shame of fools. 
<laughs> I'm sorry. That song came into my mind right now. Of course, I know it's Chain of Fools, but it's kind of funny to say Shame of Fools. <laughs> shame of Evil Fools, basically. Don't be evil. Duh. Duh. <laughs> okay. Question 160. Does the spirit find himself at once in company with those whom he knew upon the earth and who died before him? They answer. The spirits say, yes. And more or less promptly, according to the degree of his affection for them and of theirs for him. They often come to meet him on his return to the spirit world and help to free him from the bonds of matter. Others whom he formerly knew, but whom he had lost sight of during his sojourn on the earth, also come to meet him. He sees those who are in erraticity, and he goes to visit those who are still incarnated. Yay! Hauntings. Woohoo! My daddy haunted me after he died. It was so awesome. <laughs> Ooh, it's October. I'll have to tell you guys that that whole the, the story of my dad's. Uh, I'll I'll say that on the day of his, on the day that he died. I'll tell you guys that story. <laughs> he died October twelfth. So there we go. <laughs> Back to our book. Question one hundred sixty one. In cases of violent or accidental death, when the organs have not been weakened by age or sickness, does the separation of the soul take place simultaneously with the cessation of organic life? The spirits answer. It does so usually, and at any rate, the interval between them in all such cases is very brief. Yeah, you get popped out of your body really quick when if you die violently or accidentally. Good to know. Oh my good God. This next question. Are you kidding me right now? Oh God. Sorry guys. In advance. Question 162. After decapitation. For instance. Does a man retain consciousness for a longer or shorter time? Shit. The spirits answer. He frequently does so for a few minutes until the organic life of the body is completely extinct. But on the other hand, the fear of death often causes a man to lose consciousness before the moment of execution. Ooh, they thought that he was talking about executions. When I read decapitation, I was thinking accidental decapitation. You know, like when you're on a snowmobile and you go across a wire fence. (laughs) <laughs> it's a common thing in Minnesota. Sorry for that image. <laughs> oh my God. Oh, uh, you know, that's what I used to do for a living in France in another life. I was the executioner. Ew. I put so many people, hundreds of people, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people in that situation. Ew. Uh, I'm sorry to all those, including my son, who I did that to. I mean, it was just my job. Pay good money. At least my mother was proud. Okay. Alan Kardec has his little two cents to put in here. He says, <laughs> The question here proposed refers simply to the consciousness which the victim may have of himself as a man through the intermediary of the bodily organs and not as a spirit. If he has not lost this consciousness before execution, he may retain it for a few months a- moments afterwards, but this persistence of consciousness can only be of a very short duration and must necessarily cease with the cessation of the organic life of the brain. The cessation of the human consciousness, however, by no means implies the complete separation of the perispirit from the body. On the contrary, in all cases in which death has resulted from violence and not from a gradual extinction of the vital forces, the bonds which unite the body to the pure spirit are more tenacious and the separation is effected more slowly. <sighs> Good God. It's like kind of a very gruesome night for this stuff, right? <sighs> Snarky and gruesome. Huh. 
Ha ha, the two words that indicate the theme of the evening. Temporarily confused state of the soul after death. Question 163. Does the soul on quitting the body find itself at once in possession of its self-consciousness? The spirits say, not at once. It is for a time in a state of confusion, which obscures all of its perceptions. Freaking great. Question 164. Do all spirits experience in the same degree and for the same length of time the confusion which follows the separation of soul from the body? Spirits say, no, this depends entirely on their degree of elevation. He who has already accomplished a certain amount of purification recovers his consciousness almost immediately because he had already freed himself from the thraldom of materiality during his bodily life. Whereas the carnally minded man, he whose conscious conscience is not clear, retains the impression of matter for a much longer time. Question 165. Does the knowledge of spiritism exercise any influence on the duration of this state of confusion? They say, it exercises a very considerable influence on that duration because it enables the spirit to understand beforehand the new situation in which it's about to find itself. But the practice of rectitude during the earthly life and a clear conscience are the conditions which conduce more powerfully to shorten it. That's good. I mean, a shorter state of confusion is better, right? Oh my God. And then he went ahead and put a very long explanation afterwards. All right. So Alan Kardec kind of reiterates and says more here. He says, at the moment of death, everything appears confused. The soul takes some time to recover its self-consciousness for It is as though stunned and in a state similar to that of a man waking out of a deep sleep, trying to understand his own situation. It gradually regains clearness of thought and the memory of the past in proportion to the weakening of the influence of the material envelope from which it has just freed itself and the clearing away of the sort of fog that obscured its consciousness. The duration of the state of confusion that follows death varies greatly in different cases. It may be only of a few hours. It may be of several months or even years. (sighs) (laughs) Wow. Those with whom it lasts the least are they who during earthly life have identified themselves most closely with their future state because they are soonest able to understand their new situation. The state of confusion assumes special aspects according to character, character real peculiar. Oh my God. This is like a tongue twister. Character peculiarities, peculiarity. I cannot even say this. I dare you guys to say that five times fast. Characterial peculiarities. I can't even say it. Sorry. I'll just read it again and try it one more time. This state of confusion assumes special aspects according to characterial peculiarities. (sighs) And also according to different modes of death. In all cases of violent or sudden death by suicide, by capital punishment, accident, apoplexy, etc., the spirit is surprised, astounded, and does not believe himself to be dead. He obstinately persists in asserting the contrary. And nevertheless, he sees the body he has quitted as something apart from himself. He knows that body to be his own, and he cannot make out how it should be separated from him. He goes about among the persons with whom he is united by ties of affection. He speaks to them and cannot conceive why they don't hear him. This sort of illusion lasts 
until the entire separation of the perish spirit from the earthly body, for it is only when this is accomplished that the spirit begins to understand his situation and becomes aware that he no longer forms a part of the world of human beings. Death having come upon him by surprise, the spirit is stunned by the suddenness of the change that has taken place in him. For him, death is still synonymous with destruction, annihilation, and he thinks, sees, hears. It seems to him that he cannot be dead. And this illusion is still further strengthened by his seeing himself with a body similar in form to the one he has quitted. For he does not at first perceive its ethereal nature but supposes it to be solid and compact like the other. And when his attention is called to this, to this point, he is astonished to finding that it is not palpable. This phenomenon is analogous to that which occurs in the case of somnambulists who, when thrown for the first time into the magnetic sleep, cannot believe that they're not awake. Sleep, according to their idea of it, is synonymous with suspension of the perceptive faculties. And as they think freely, then see, they appear to themselves not to be asleep. Some spirits present this peculiarity, (laughs) even in cases where death has not supervened unexpectedly, but it more frequently occurs in the case of those who, although they may have been ill, had no expectation of death. The curious spectacle is then presented of a spirit attending his own funeral as though it were that of someone else, and speaking of it as of something which in a way concerns him, until the moment when it at length he comprehends the true state of his case. In the mental confusion which follows death, there is nothing painful for him who has lived an upright life. He is calm, and his perceptions are those of a peaceful awakening out of sleep. But for him whose conscience is not clean, it is full of anxiety and anguish that become more and more poignant in proportion as he recovers consciousness. In cases of collective death, ooh, karma conventions, (laughs) in which many persons have perished together in the same catastrophe. It has been observed that they do not always see one another immediately afterwards. In the state of confusion which follows death, each spirit goes his own way or concerns himself only with those in whom he takes an interest. Wow, it was really interesting. Cool. Well, there it is. That's the end of the show for the evening. Very, very interesting stuff indeed. I love this book. I hope you guys are liking this re- these readings. Um, the two books I'm reading every week are very different from one another. But um, both are old-fashioned and... Very interesting, though. I mean, this this one answered a couple questions. It kind of cleared up a few things for me. I'm creeped out by a couple of the revelations therein. But, uh, wow. Ah, wow, just wow. crazy crazy stuff well there you have it guys I want to thank each and every one of you for listening to my show please tell all your friends and Facebook groups and all your people about Metaphysical Soul Speak the podcast especially to the like minded folks that well that are like us that like spiritual stuff and strange paranormal and supernatural things as well as learning about natural health and well being mental health and well-being and spiritual health and well-being and who love a good channeling or two. I enjoy uh, reading the books to you and doing all the things that I do. I 
this is my passion. And I, and I love that I have an audience. So thank you for being that audience. I also want to thank you further on a grander scale for being a part of this ascension journey with me because we are all in the same boat. We're all going through the same things, similar things. And in the end, we're all going to we'll be together again and again and again. But we are in the fifth dimension now and we're in the process of becoming more and more anchored in that. I think that it will finalize and be complete when the greater majority of the sleeping ones awake. And when they awaken, it's going to be pretty cool, pretty great. In the meantime, we're going through revolutions. <laughs> <laughs> We're going through revolutions and evolutions. I remember, the word love is spelled secretly and backwards in the middle of both of those words. So we all have to keep our minds and our hearts focused on love at all times. For that is what is going to help us see it through. I'm still looking for ghost stories for metaphysical ghost speak coming up for Halloween. I am still looking for Santa Claus miracle stories. Have you ever met Santa Claus? I don't mean the one in the mall, not one of Santa's helpers. Santa himself has he arrived in your house have you seen him did you see a flash of red energy in your house on Christmas Eve did you see the lights go across the sky so fast that you doubted yourself for a second but you just knew that was maybe Rudolph and the other reindeer <laughs> that was maybe Santa Claus I'd like to hear it. I'd like to hear your stories. We're going to do a special Christmas special. If you have any miracles surrounding your holiday, whether it's Christmas or Hanukkah or Diwali or whatever your particular holiday is at this time of year, I'd like to hear about that too so we can make a very special episode for it. Have you received miracles after you've written Santa Claus a letter. <laughs> anything to do with spirits, anything to do with St. Nick, I want your stories, and I really need the Halloween ones really fast because we're running out of time, guys. We're already to the 7th. The 7th of October. I can't even believe it. <laughs> All right, well, I'm putting this out early tonight because I don't know if the energy is going to turn be turned off or not I'm going to try to get it out a little bit earlier than usual um, in the coming week just because of the crazy chaos that this <laughs> social revolution is uh, bringing to my doorstep literally here in Ecuador but um, anyway yeah so please send in your stories and I love each and every one of you I wish you peace and joy and wellness on your ascension journey. But right now I'm signing off with peace and joy <laughs> and the high vibes of the holy fifth dimension. Until next time, guys. Peace. Do you ever wish you could look into the next chapter in your book of life and see what's coming next. What does the universe have in store for you? I can help you with that. I will give you a Celtic cross reading, which is 10 cards, or you can ask me three questions and I use three cards per question. So that's nine cards or I can channel your higher guidance or maybe God directly for you. Maybe you want to talk to your dear departed Aunt Edna. 
because maybe you have a few questions and she was the smartest person you knew. If your deceased relatives are available or your ascended masters, I can channel them for you personally. Let me have one hour to show you the future in your next chapter of your book of life. Readings are $75 and it takes me an hour to an hour and a half to complete. And for this price, you will also be hooked up to the healing grid around the planet for free, which means yours truly, me, I will be giving you Reiki 24 hours a day, seven days a week for the rest of your life. All you have to do is let me know. Metaphysical soul speak at gmail.com and we will explore your future together.